morning. First of all, I want to uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come to this event. I hope you find it interesting. And I'll try and not hit the mic, which is one of my uh, standard things I do when I talk. Uh, let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, this is our agenda, which which matches what uh, which is on your uh, uh, on the tables. So we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about some big things, and we're going to go in through all the way from upstream, kind of all the way down through through fuel and transportation. Now each of these uh, talks are to last about 45 minutes. We have plans for the uh, for the formal presentation last about 30 minutes, leaving time for Q and A. So. We would hope there is some questions in the, uh, a time from you from the audience, and we have a chance to exchange some additional thoughts. And we're going to try and stick to this schedule, so uh, hopefully our, uh, uh, we we will not uh, run over too much on the presentations. You know, before I start, if you bear with me, I'd like to give you a five-minute overview, a little bit more about what who Stratus Advisors are, uh, so set the context of. Who, who's up here uh, talking to you, and uh, just to explain a, a little bit more about our practice. So we are a global research and consulting firm. We're headquartered in Houston, Texas, uh, but we also have offices in, in New York City and uh, Europe in Brussels, and then also in Asia, in Singapore, KL, and uh, we'll be soon opening an office here in, in Del outside of Delhi. Uh, so uh, we're global. We cover the whole value chain, upstream, midstream, downstream, including refining petrochemical and what we call fuel and transportation. So really a weld the wheels all the way from production through consumption. Uh, we also cover uh, the macro factors affecting the uh, oil and gas and related sectors, so macroeconomics, geopolitics, policy, and regulations. Um, we're all about trying to help our clients understand the future uh, market environment, future competitive landscape, and how for them to best make uh, the right strategic decisions to position them, uh, them for that future, helping them understand the upside, but also the downside risk associated with, uh, with, with those decisions. Uh, our staff is made up of those who have a technical background, so uh, uh, upstream geologists, geophysicists, petroleum engineers. We also have process engineers, mechanical engineers, of course the classical consultant, the engineers with the MBA. Uh, we have a PhD level economist, financial analysts and those who have backgrounds in international relations. So that helps us bring different perspectives to, to our viewpoints uh, and, and just not think about it as what I always say, like an oil man in Houston. We try and look at all the different perspectives, stakeholders and what's happening outside of, uh, of the U.S. and to all the different regions. We have dedicated teams for each of these uh, segments and today we have representatives from each one of the segments. Uh, so I mentioned upstream, midstream, downstream, fuel and transport, and then we have the fifth one, which is our, our executive suite or our macro viewpoints. Um, it, each of these teams have senior people plus junior staff underneath them. Oh, I don't know where that came from. All right. So we have three main ways we work with our, with, uh, with our clients. So we try and be very flexible the way you get access to our analysis and to our analyst. Uh, we have our online services, which we're going to show some of the analysis today from those services. We have bespoke consulting engagements, and we also have advisory retainers. So we're very flexible in the way you get access to our analysts and to our analysis. Right? And we're trying to set it up where we can tailor our uh, services to what is best for the client. And additionally, we have really no sales staff, so we want to create no barrier between us and our counterparts. Uh, this, as I said, uh, we're going to pull from a lot of these services today, so I just wanted to show you uh, the, the suite of services we have that start with upstream, so both shale, non-shale, uh, conventional, unconventional, all the way global uh, viewpoint on what's happening in upstream. Midstream, which is uh, you know all about moving that energy to the demand center, so oil, natural gas, NGLs, so forth. Uh, downstream, refining and petrochemicals, and then fuel and transport, which starts with fuel specifications, 
our out, uh, outlook around alternative fuels, including biofuels, and then what's happening in the automotive sector. And then uh, last, under Exacta Suite, is all about our macro viewpoint, including where we see price forecasts, uh, going prices, margins, crack spreads, uh, 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 differentials, and so forth, both in the short term and the long term. So we'll be drawing from a lot of this today. Uh, we also do a lot of work, I said, on the consulting, bespoke, not only helping clients understand the external environment, but how it applies to them. What's, uh, what's their portfolio? What are the initiatives they have? What are they trying to do? And how does that, uh, how does that fit in with the future? Okay. And then we do a lot of retainers work, which gives that clients a lot of access, uh, flexibility in the way of not only do we do quarterly updates on the, the topics that are uh, uh, most of, uh, uh, of importance to the management team, but also gives you access to, uh, to request ad hoc requests throughout the year. So very flexible in that, in that way. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me on that, uh, that uh, explanation of Stratus. And now hopefully I'll get in this, the, the things that you'll find just as interesting as that first part. Okay. So these are the major things that we see going on right now. Some of these are obvious, hopefully they make sense, but we see a changing energy mix, shifting energy flows, evolving transportation sector, and an intensifying regulatory environment. These are the major things that we think are going to drive the future, okay? And I'm gonna go through each one of these here in a little bit more detail. So when we look at the changing energy mix, I mean, for uh, those who've been in the industry not that long ago, uh, the situation, for example, in, in the US was completely different, right? Back in 2006, seven, we were gonna have a shortage of hydrocarbon. Uh, the US was worried about importing LNG. They were worried that we were going to, people were still talking about peak oil. Well, obviously all that has changed. We don't have, nobody, not many people are talking about peak oil anymore, and the U.S. is now looking at as exporting LNG, not importing. So complete change there. So what has happened? Well, of course, one is shale, and that's been a big input uh, factor in the U.S., changing the whole environment in terms of su su supply uh, situation. But we also have issues going on with non-shale, and, and my colleague Shu is going to talk about that in more detail. But what we've had is, while we've developed the shale, we've also had some of the non-shale areas, uh, investments slow down, and some of that production that we thought was going to be coming on in the future has been, has been pushed off to the future. So that's changing things. And then natural gas, we see is going to be a new importance growing on that as we make the transition to our cleaner uh, fuels as we go forward. And then we, then we have, uh, on, the, on the demand side, we really have this, this focus, ongoing focus around clean energy and alternative fuels. So the, these are, uh, what's happening on the supply side, the demand side is really changing where we see the source of marginal production and across the time horizons, right? So there's things happening now in the short term, but as we look out in the midterm and long term, these, the, the, this uh, changing energy mix is going to, going to continue to impact the supply demand dynamics as we move forward. Now, one of the big factors that we've seen in the, in the world is making a big shift away from OECD world, non-OECD, uh, world and also from Atlantic Basin to Pacific Basin. So all the growth is being shifted away from uh, uh, the old uh, OECD countries to Asia and uh, so you're going to see growth in Asia but also in, in North America. So what happens is you're going to have uh, Europe will play a, a smaller portion of the, of the, of the, the future and also uh, uh, Japan and so forth and these, these, uh, uh, these economies that are have aging demographics and they're going to have a slowdown. So you're getting the shift towards uh, uh, the rest of Asia, these emerging markets, and then also North America will still hold up better than Europe in some ways because of the demographics of the U.S. Right? That we still have a growing population, even though there is a, a, a 
some issues around maybe what, what's going to happen around the immigration in the short term. We still see the U.S. population continue to grow. It's not as old as Europe, and, uh, and we see that uh, continuing to grow. But that's going to be a different world, and this has already been ongoing, but we're going to see this more and more as the shift towards the non-OECD world. And, what, and, and then when you look at oil demand, well, you're going to see that we expect in our reference case, and we'll talk more about this, uh, 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 Ashley will, uh, when we, we talk about the, uh, our short-term and longer-term outlook for prices and so forth. Uh, but we, we expect oil to remain a part of the, the mix, right? And we expect oil demand to continue to grow uh, because even though we're seeing a slowdown of plateauing in Europe, and even in the U.S. later out on and, and and gasoline, uh, we expect Asia and these other emerging markets will continue to grow. So we, we think they'll remain a mix. But if you look where a lot of that growth is coming, it's all coming from, from, from uh, mainly from Asia. So you're seeing Europe is going to decline some, Asia will grow, and then you also see uh, uh, North America though holding up fairly well. But that's going to be a whole different mix than what we have today. Right, and, and really the world was designed to move supply from towards Europe into the US and that is now shifting dramatically. Okay, so if you look at natural gas the same way, you see that Asia remains a big part of where that natural gas demand will come from as there's a shift uh, away from dirtier fuels and also to support the growing economies. All right, so, so that's what's happening on uh, uh, the, with the energy mix, the shifting, where we see shifting demand growth, that's going to change where we see en, uh, the energy flows, right? So we got uh, uh, growing parts of the world, and, and that's going to continue. We got the shifting focus from Atlantic Basin, Pacific Basin. And then another one is you've got this expanding role of the U.S. as an energy supplier. Crude, NGLs, refined products, natural gas is all... Uh, part of the mix of what the U.S. is going to be exporting and continue to export. And then another factor you have is the geopolitics. So you're going to have this ongoing uh, uh, issues with OPEC uh, and the, the connection with Russia, the Middle East, and then China and the U.S. This will have an impact on energy flows as we go forward. Okay? So what's going to happen is there's going to be bottlenecks, dislocation, and investment requirements to, to, to create this new, new pattern. Of, of, of for the world. So this is an example, right? If you look at uh, at the, at the uh, uh, upper right, you see the U.S. crude production is going to increase over the next ten years by uh, more than four million barrels. But exports are going to grow from less than a million, somewhere around three quarters of a million barrels today, up to over to three point four million barrels over uh, by twenty twenty seven. So you're going to have this uh, additional barrels that will be going out into the world and, and, and changing the, the dynamics around crude flows and crude supplies. So this is where we're looking at, when our team looked at where do we think this crude will go? Well, a lot of it's going to go to Asia, but in 2027, over 2 million barrels. We see some going to Latin America. Uh, we also see some of it will go up to Canada, from the U.S. up to Canada. And then some going to Europe over time, but a good portion of this is going to be moving to Asia. So this is a completely different dynamic than what we've seen just a few years ago as the U.S. starts to now export and will continue the export. Another factor we have is this expanding regulatory environment. Uh, so what we have, we have factors that are going to affect the upstream. So if you look in the, the U.S., there's issues around methane, there's issues around earthquakes, there's issues around water management. These will all continue to affect what's happening in upstream, but they also, you see this play out in other parts of the world where, uh, where there is shale-related assets but are being held up because of a lot of it is regulatory and above-ground issues. We also have uh, the global uh, greenhouse gases will still be a factor, uh, even though the U.S. is, uh, is right now is, is uh, 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 playing a, a lesser uh, role in, in this area. Th we expect that this will stay, remain an issue that, uh, that will, will have it, an impact. 
And then when we get down to like tightening fuel specifications, so we know like the IMO even is uh, with the shift on the bunker market, uh, but also the ongoing uh, movement of tighter specs on gasoline and diesel and so forth. And Hugh Ming will talk more about this at, this afternoon. And then uh, subsidies and mandates. So we've had some uh, subsidies go away for fuel, but we also have a lot of subsidies and mandates around electric vehicles, alternative energy su uh, support, and that's going to continue to play a role and affect future supply and demand. So while we see these, the, the impact and the momentum ebb and flow over time, we think this is going to be an ongoing uh, part of what, what is going to drive the future. It's this expanding and growing regulatory environment. And, uh, and it, it, it will continue to be a major factor. So when you look at one uh, uh, issue, uh, the transportation sector, which we, is very important to the oil demand, obviously, there are some common drivers across all of the transportation sector, all the ways looking at uh, road, off-road, marine, rail, and aviation. But you, of course, you have electrification, which uh, 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 Trey will talk more about what the impact will be on the, on the uh, automotive sector. We got digitization, aut autonomous uh, t uh, uh, technology, and, and the focus on efficiency gains and using clean energy. Then this really plays out in some way across all these factors. So definitely in light duty, it, it has the biggest impact when we looked at electrification and what we see in terms of efficiency gains and shifting towards cleaner fuels. Uh, but you also see that some on heavy duty and off-road, but it, in that area, we're still very dependent on diesel, so there's, there's a, 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 may not have as big an impact there. Marine, I already mentioned, IMO, uh, is going to have an impact on the, on the bottom of the barrel, and also on the, uh, what we're showing on this different economic growth, different crew, uh, energy flows is going to have an impact on shipping patterns and, 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 and how that will affect uh, shipping costs and uh, as we go forward. And then uh, rail uh, is, uh, you may have focus on efficiency, but how much will rail be developed over time in these different countries and markets will, will have an impact on, uh, on overall uh, demand. And then aviation, we have uh, uh, focus on efficiency. There's also looking at trying to use biofuels, but also even things like how that might change over time as you get more efficient, longer distance planes that can fly point to point instead of hub to hub can change so what's going to happen there, right? Instead of flying, everybody flying to Heathrow or to uh, Dubai, maybe you're having start more direct point to point flights as you have even smaller planes like a 737, which can uh, where they uh, maybe fly 16 hours and, th and then make that more efficient than the hub to hub. So that could have some impact. We're saying is there's a lot of factors that are going to change the th transportation sector, not just in the vehicle sector. Then you can see what, what the impact is. If you look at the portion of oil demand that's represented by the transportation sector in 2015, it's around 57%. And when we look out to 2035, it's still going to be around 60% uh, or so. So this is in the reference case, but if you look, where is some of the biggest risk to downside in terms of demand? It's going to be related to the transportation sector. That's where you have a lot of technologies being developed, a lot of focus, and this is where you could have a significant downside risk in terms of demand growth. Okay, let me move on to some takeaways here. All right, now, as we move forward, as I said, we, we think hydrocarbons is going to remain an important part of the energy mix, right? And it's going to depend on, on which scenario and which path we take forward, how big of a role it will play. But obviously it will stay in, in an important role. But we're going to have a lot of uh, uh, that future, there's a lot of uncertainty partially from these tensions that you get from geopolitics, economic growth, and, and, uh, and, then and concerns about climate and environment and how those will be balanced over time. So there's a lot of focus and talk about trying to be more, uh, more uh, clean, green, and so forth, but that's outweighed by what's happening, by, in some cases, by what's happening with the concerns about economic growth and also geopolitics. So you have people 
uh, certain uh, countries looking to gain access to natural resources and control those natural resources because of concerns about geopolitical issues. And so all those dynamics play out that will, depend on how they play out, will how, what world will we move towards in the future? And, it's, and, and we think there's a lot of uncertainty. Now I joke about this, you know, oil prices, what are, they're always volatile and we expect them to remain volatile. But I think as we move forward, there's a lot of uncertainty where that future will be over time, right? Maybe more so than ever when we look back here, because now not only do we have issues, the traditional issues around supply, geopolitics, macroeconomics, but we also have a lot of uncertainty on the demand side now. And I think that's, that's going to make it, uh, 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 makes predicting the future even more difficult than in the past. And then, you know, as we say, tomorrow's not going to be the same as today, right? So drawing trend lines out is probably not going to be the right, uh, where the world's going to end up. We're going to have some shocks to the system. We're going to have something that's going to change where we're at. Uh, either it is going to be the technology breakthroughs or it's going to be macroeconomics or it's going to be some geopolitical issue that's going to change the path we are on today. So here, here's some of our, uh, our scenarios. You know, so we have our reference case, which uh, Ashley's going to go through a lot uh, later on our price forecast. Uh, I'm going to talk some more about this in, in, our, uh, down, in the downstream section. But we also have um, two other cases. One is where we shift towards a new global framework, right? The world adjusts. We move away from an OECD-dominated world to, to where we have a framework to, that allows these emerging economies to come in and play a bigger role. So that affects things like the old institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, and so forth. And you set up something that more reflects where the real power is growing in the world. And you move forward towards cooperation, right? So this is where you would get more diffusion of technology, uh, uh, freer trade, uh, uh, and, and a drive towards real global solutions. Uh, I don't think that's the world we're in right now, but that's, that is a scenario we have, okay? And then our downside is where we break into these multipolars, uh, uh, poles of power, right? So you have the U.S. and Europe, but then you have what's going on with China, you have uh, Russia, you have these other uh, issues going on that kind of push the world apart, and you end up into these multipoles of power, and less cooperation, more concerns about the need to secure resources, protect your own industries, protect your economies, and so forth. That kind of sounds like where we're in maybe moving towards a little bit more today than we would be to the upside case, depending on where you sit, right? But what does that mean in terms of prices? So, you know, and these are nominal terms, so when you, uh, dollars, right? So if you look out, if we're in, the, in our reference case, we're back towards there's still going to be growing oil demand. We're, we need to invest to meet that demand. To invest in that demand is going to require more expensive oil, including offshore, unconventional, and so forth. And if you look at where we are, you know, the, the marginal barrel and the cost of that barrel would push that price up because not only would you need it for the IOCs to support their investments, which are always in the more expensive uh, areas, but you also, uh, com uh, countries like Saudi Arabia needed to balance out their social requirements, and so that kind of sets up this path where you start to come back and you have uh, higher oil prices. Now what this doesn't show, I'm sure over the next 20 years or so we're going to have an economic downturn of some sort, right, and could reset that lower. You know, because we haven't got back up to the trend we were before 2008, so we could see that that being uh, demand being pushed downward and that price could be lower, right? But it's hard to predict recessions and so it's not included in a reference case. And then the green is, 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 is this movement towards a, a better world, right? The, the idea that you're moving towards uh, greater cooperation, which in the short term drives more economic growth but in the longer term pushes away further away from oil towards non-hydrocarbon resources and to cleaner and, 
and uh, uh, faster diffusion of, uh, of the electrification of vehicles and so forth. So you end up where the price of oil starts to drift back down. And now you're down to, um, you don't need to develop all those high uh, cost resources. You don't have to develop as much of the Canadian oil sands, as much as the deep water, and it pushes down. And then the red, which is our downside, is where you get this world where you're, you're, you, 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 you've got this um, competition, the concerns about security of supply, less economic growth because you got more friction, friction in the global economy, and you end up bouncing around, right? You hit, then you, you, you know, and you, there, and, and, the, and the demand is weaker because you got less economic growth, uh, but you don't have as much of the, the adoption of the newer technologies, right? So uh, you, you, you don't move as fast away from oil, but you have less economic growth. And then you have, as I said, this concern about uh, uh, supply, security of supply and security of natural resources. So you just bounce around in, in this, in this, in this uh, uh, $60 to $70 type uh, range. Okay. So wh what does that mean? These are v vastly different futures, they are. Huh? Yeah, these are nominal, nominal, uh, inflation included, right? So, if you look, at, uh, essentially, it's around two percent inflation or so, kind of a number. But you look, at, you know, when we look at the oil industry uh, and its ability to uh, um, manage that increasing cost, in the past, the industry's done a good job of of, of controlling cost and actually their costs going up lower the rate than the inflation when they don't have to develop new resources, right? When they had, to, and so for a long period from the mid 80s to like 2000, they were very good at controlling cost. But as soon as they start ramping up to develop new resources, new projects, that cost structure exploded. And you can see that now, what's happening now, the supply, the service sector gets uh, uh, pushed down, they, nobody invests, you lose resources, you lose capabilities, and then if you need to start building back up, that all has to uh, be rebuilt, and then the, the, the service sector has some uh, uh, pricing power and so forth, there's shortages and, and that. So that's why uh, we, we, we don't see that the oil industry can maintain a flat or, or lower cost structure over time if they need to increase production, okay? so. So you have these different views of what could happen in the world. There's a lot of uncertainty and uh, which way we're going to go. And, it, and, uh, and, uh, and I said, uh, we're, uh, we have certain things going on in the world that will, are temporary, will change. We're going to have uh, the US president we have now will definitely not be president in longer than seven years. And we're going to have a new, new view. And, Typically, the U.S. bounces back and forth, right? If you have very one way, then the next one comes in, and it's because the, it's a reaction, right? They get tired of that, and then they, we, the people want to shift back another way. So that could change that all these dynamics again, right? So it's that's why there's a lot of one reason there's a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so so how do you manage that uncertainty? What is the right way to make the right strategic decisions? How do you how do you manage for the future while knowing there's a lot of uncertainty? So I've got some things. Some of this will be obvious, maybe, but um, you know, good, good uh, setting strategy, making right strategic decisions. Stay to stay. Uh, they have certain principles. One, we think you have to have, take a portfolio view, and you have to understand what. Where are you creating value, not only today, but in the future, right? And you have to understand how this portfolio is, a, is, a, is, is, a, is, is connected. Now, one, the one example, uh, not to be critical, but if you look at the oil industry, um, some of the American oil companies, they decided when oil prices were very high, they should spin off their downstream because the downstream just wasn't going to make the money and be... Uh, 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 help the, their share price. Well, they did that, and uh, if you take a Conoco Phillips, you take a Marathon, which is a small, mid, or smaller, more mid-sized company in the U.S. When they spun them off, 
the upstream course did very poorly because oil prices dropped and the refining did very well. So uh, trying to understand how that will change over time uh, instead of uh, what we say uh, uh, buying high and selling low, you might want to think how that, those will change over time and when you make portfolio changes, what risk are you assuming that you may not have had before? We think when you look at investment of assets across the value chain, you got to understand the structural factors and the operational uh, 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 performance, right? And there, you can't take a bad asset and if you focus only on improving cost efficiencies and, and reliability, you, you, that in some cases is just not enough. If you've got a bad asset, it's a bad asset because maybe it's too small, the wrong complexity, the wrong location, and it just doesn't have the, what is required to be successful. And so you have to understand what is it? Is it a structural issue or is it an operational issue? And decide how, how, what is the right strategy for moving forward with that. And also, when you make investments, make sure you're only investing in those who have long-term structural uh, uh, advantages that are going to weather the storm when you have bad times or, or more difficult market times. Right, so I think that that's important as you look forward, not how, what, where they stand today, but where will they be in five years and 10 years? So you can be proactive in the way you manage your, your, your asset base. Uh, when you look at opportunities, I think you gotta look at both, as you said, where is the short term, the mid term, the long term, and what's the materiality of those opportunities? And what are the capabilities you need to be able to uh, perform in, 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 the, in those areas? So if you're entering new markets, entering new parts of the value chain, how, what, what do you need to be successful? And, and are you wasting time on things that aren't material? And are also, are you too anchored to the past, trying to hold on to positions that are going to be weaker in the future and not investing in the new ones going forward? So how do you strike that balance? And then I think this one I think is, is the risk. Not just looking at the upside potential, what's the downside? And as you, as you move forward, how are these risks changing over time? If you make investments or you make changes to your portfolio, how is that affecting your risk profile over time? And, how, and can I manage that risk? Can I mitigate it? And, and have an explicit view on what those risks are going forward. And you see examples of companies who don't understand the risks they're taking on. And there's some classic ones in the US like Enron and companies like that who apparently didn't understand that they were betting the whole company based on the strategy they had. And if the market moved a certain way or they had issues with their balance sheet that they were just gonna go belly up. And of course, US banks are another good example of that. But, I, and I think that was some of the issue when you look at the oil companies who decide to split off and focus only on upstream. When you look at risk adjusted returns and take in all the uh, factors that drive uh, 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 returns, upstream in a lot of cases could be more risky than further down the chain. And it's not just looking at the absolute returns in the good times, it's understanding how volatile that will be and what it will ha do to your position. So. Shale companies in the U.S. Uh, are facing that too, where they got took on all kinds of debt, where they were focusing on uh, buying acreage, pushing up production, trying to drive up their share price. But what they found when the oil price dropped down, they didn't have the ability to repay back that debt. So someone went out of business and some were, um, were forced to merge and so forth. So I think it's important to understand not only the current risk, but how those will change over time. And I think you have to look at the whole business model, right? In, in this business, you have to understand your, 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 your uh, 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 customers. So I try and remind upstream companies that the only real customers of crude is refiners. Um, but also all the stakeholders you have, you can't ignore this. As we said, there's this regulatory environment out there. So trying to not understand uh, where those those are, are coming and what's driving that and how to manage that process with that and take into account what's happening with the other stakeholders is, I think it's important. Understanding the service sector and who's providing you and, and what impact that will have. So I, I think um, 
there's a balance there, for example, in the service sector. There are times where the industry can really, uh, the, the asset holder can really drive hard bargains with the service sector and drive them down to where they make no money and they're barely surviving. And, but at some point you're going to need that service sector. So if, you, if the focus is doing that, you end up where you're actually destroying the whole va a va a part of the value chain that's going to be critical at some point. So trying to understand how this all works together uh, and, and how having the right, you know, if you're going to pick a strategy, the asset portfolio, the capabilities you need, and the network of external providers you need to make this all work, okay? So um, that is uh, some uh, high level viewpoint. The other uh, presentations get much more into the nitty gritty of the supply demand fundamentals and the outlook and so forth. But we wanted to uh, start this with, with a uh, kind of setting the tone where we see the big macro drivers and, and, and some things companies should keep in mind as they move forward, okay? I don't know where we're on time. All right, is there any questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Regarding the assumptions, not only you know all the consultants on the shale production, shale oil production from US. Yes. And uh, you must be aware because you are working with the data, the shale oil production, which has changed the uh, the, the complete dynamics uh, of the country. And from a uh, uh, bare uh, zero level, it has gone up to four to five million barrels per day. But nobody is considering the decline rate of the shale oil production. What? The decline rate is a very high decline rate. The two major fields, that is Eagle Port and uh, Palmian Basin, they are already on a decline mode. So if you consider that decline condition and the number of uh, massive drilling which is going on in US, and then forecast it in your kind of production increase which you are showing over a period of time, I think you can, uh, you can make a, a nice uh, kind of you know assessment on that. Yeah, I, I would just say that uh, our shale team uh, it does look at um, at the well level, all the uh, production uh, associated, both the initial production, the decline rates. We also look at drilling programs, and we, we balance that against uh, uh, where we think the ge geological potential is. We look at uh, what companies' uh, financial potential uh, uh, capabilities are and what that will mean for future uh, drilling and then what, what it will mean for future production. So we are taking into account decline rates, and there are parts of shale plays that have been drilled uh, and maybe uh, uh, some of the best spots have been drilled quite substantially. There are parts of Eagleford, uh, but there we do believe that there is more potential to be developed over a time. Permian, but also when we're looking up into the into the Rockies part of the U.S., there's uh, plays that are yet very early days yet that's still being developed out. You got uh, areas in the mid, what we call mid-continent in the Oklahoma area and that, that are still being developed. So we do believe even with the decline rates, uh, that the U.S. production will continue the increase. So what we're seeing is some improvements uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, res improved results coming from com new completion techniques, longer laterals, more frac stations, pumping in more prop in, and things like that that are allowing them to get uh, 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 improved productivity and efficiency out of that. But we are not ones who think everything grows to the sky, right? There is a point where it does start to, uh, to flatten out and start uh, to, to move towards more of a plateau situation. Um, yeah, that's correct, because uh, you see the uh, US has reached a level of 10 million production in the 70s, uh, the last, it has hit the peak, and that is due to the Gulf of Mexico deep waters. And to bring, uh, to come down to a level of 5 million, it took almost 40 years, uh, 2010 it has come to 5 million. And that's the conventional play how they, uh, uh, how they behave, and shale is completely different kind of uh, structure, and your shale team must be doing. I will be happy to discuss on this issue uh, from the FIPI point of uh, point of view as the industry uh, representative. Well, 
Thank you. Yeah, and, we, and I look forward to that, but uh, thank you for that question. Hi, my name is Anandya Chaudhary from Shell. First of all, an excellent presentation. I hope you'll be able to share that back with us at some point. My question relates to your business as usual scenario. Is that compatible with a uh, below two degrees centigrade world? And if so, have you considered the costs of carbon capture? No, it, it, our reference case is not compatible with the, 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 the with 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 that uh, that two degree. No, so um, one because as I said, there's right now there is no uh, mechanism to drive the world to that, right? Uh, so even the Paris Accord is voluntarily. Voluntarily, uh, countries signing up to move forward with some something. Uh, there's no way of measuring what the impact they're going to have. So we think we're far away from that world where you're going to actually have uh, real uh, 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 movement investments required to 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 create that world. And as I said, the the issue where you got geopolitics, the need for economic growth. Uh, also, uh, offsetting the, 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 the some people's desire for a cleaner, greener world is it, those two factors have a lot of uh, pull. They do, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, people don't vote for politicians that are campaigning on that platform. Uh, the, at the end of the day, people want security, they want economic growth, and so forth. And, and so I, I, in our reference case, we don't see that happening. Uh, down the road, we'll, could we get a, a carbon tax or something like that? That's a possibility. Uh, but uh, uh, we think we're more in to mitigate the impact than to, to eliminate the impact of, of, a, of a global, of a, of a, a warmer world. Uh, the, the green case is where we see where we would have more drive to do that. Um, but it, it, it's really hard at this point uh, to see how we get to that, to that level, uh, to that world, unless there's some really tech, technical uh, technology breakthroughs. Uh, I know there's people who say that you can produce, uh, 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 you know, solar is more efficient or, or getting close to being competitive and wind is competitive and all this. The problem is, is you know, the scale is so huge, right? I mean. How do you uh, how do you replace uh, even a, a portion of the almost hundred million barrels of oil we use every day? I mean the scale is just massive, and I think the, that we're a long ways away from that at this point. And you can see examples, right? Look at Europe, right? Uh, so Germany, for example, uh, they shut down their nuke plants and they replaced it with coal, right? So they didn't really say, hey, we're going to replace it with more. So they've invested a lot in wind, they've invested a lot in solar, which probably don't even make sense necessarily from an economic standpoint, because I don't think it's real sunny in Germany most of the time. And, uh, but, you know, they, they, they push forward with those type of programs. And I think that's also a risk. If you push forward with, too fast with, with implementing technology that don't solve the problem, all you do is create uh, an economic deficit. And that, that's an issue you have out there, and I think that holds back, and, and I think that's one of the concerns we have on, uh, on, on electric vehicles that uh, uh, Trey's going to talk more about. You know, subsidizing something that's not better is not, at the end of the day, doesn't make you wealthy. It makes you poor. And so we're still waiting for that technology breakthrough, right? So, uh, yeah. That's a long answer uh, to your question, so hopefully I address something, you. some of it. I said Sham Gupta from PPAC. Uh, it was really an excellent presentation, whatever you gave just uh, to us. Uh, my question is, uh, most of the time, whenever we see that people talk about at the global level, they talk about regional analysis in terms of demand and supply. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, can't we think about having a kind of analysis which can divide uh, rather than having the regional analysis uh, to have something in terms of developed country versus developing country? 
Because when you talk about developing countries, issues are entirely different. If you look at SDG 7, that mostly has the issues which are related with mostly developing countries rather than <coughs> developed countries. So my question is, there are certain issues which are very core and fundamentally related with uh, developing countries rather than developed countries. So uh, having that kind of divide may give better perspective. Yeah, I, I agree. You have to look at uh, countries, where they are in their economic development and what they're facing going forward. And uh, we do look at, uh, uh, when we look at uh, demand, for example, we break down to country level, but we also have different viewpoints on, on, uh, on demand growth in a non-OECD country uh, w with certain demographics, certain growth patterns than we would a other. And um, I, I agree that that is, and I, I think that is something that uh, the world needs to understand more because right now there's still a bias towards looking at, uh, you know, especially, I, I don't want to make this all about the U.S., but, uh, but when, the, when, when Europe gets much more coverage than, than uh, India and China in our news, right? And when you look at it, does it really makes, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense anymore for the U.S., you know, because uh, the U.S. is as much of a Pacific country as an Atlantic Basin country. And, and we know that the growth and the important areas are going to be in that part of the world and trying to understand what's happening in countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, and Pakistan and countries like that and, and that, in India and, and, and beyond China is, is going to drive a lot of what's happening. And this is why we're saying if you're going to get to some new global structure, you can't have uh, you know, all these Western countries sitting on uh, controlling what's going on in the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth. That structure all needs to start to change into a new framework that reflects the future, not the past. And um, I, so, so we agree. And, and our view is, and where we're focusing as a company, uh, is we believe, you, of course, we have to understand what's going on in in, the, in, in North America just because one, the supply situation and now is changing and driving and with the U.S. going to be an exporter of, of, of all products. And, 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 uh, and, and, but it's, we're really focusing on those uh, uh, non-OECD part of the world, right? And, and where we see the, the future, uh, our uh, future is going to be linked to that. So we're talking east of Suez, we're talking Africa, we're talking Asia, and, and South Asia, Southeast Asia, North Asia is all going to be part of that. How are we doing time-wise? Any other questions? If not, oh, was there, no, okay. Well then, uh, we'll wrap it up here, and uh, we'll turn it on to the uh, to our uh, to uh, my colleague Xu Fang, who's going to talk about upstream and uh, what we're seeing in terms of supply coming from upstream. Okay, thank you.